Hello, and welcome back to today's discussion. I mean, it was just raised in the last panel, but we're all part of a very important fight, and that's what really brings us to our next panel, the sugar bank, beneficial ownership of transparency and data-driven entities. Uh, my name is Adam McLean, and I'm co-founder of Regulation Asia. Now, in March 2022, the FADF formally adopted amendments to address the use of anonymous shell companies, legal arrangements, and adopted amendments to address the use of anonymous shell companies and legal arrangements by criminal actors to hide illicit profits, requiring countries to establish beneficial ownership regimes. Now, our plan today in the next minutes is really to explore the link between anonymous show companies, financial crime, and how the new standards are being implemented across jurisdictions. From reliable UBO data using customer lifecycle risk management in combination with entity resolutions, uh, analytical tools in the detection of risks to protect firms and the financial system as a whole. So we obviously have a lot of ground to cover. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our esteemed you know, panel of guests, uh, Adam McLaughlin, Director, Global Head of Financial Crime with Nice Act Minds. Welcome, Adam. Let's take myself off mute. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, and um, yeah, looking forward to a good chat. Oh, good. We have Chun Hong Tra, Senior Director, Head of Financial Crime Practice with Asia, for Asia Pacific in the Middle East from Moody Analytics. Welcome, Chun Hong. Thank you, Bradley. It's a pleasure joining you. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, Ms. Rashmi Dubier, Managing Director, Asia Pacific, Head of AML for MUFG. Welcome, Rashmi. Uh, hi, and thank you for having me on. Wonderful. I mean, as a starting point, uh, we would obviously just discuss some of the developments, but, you know, the linkage between anonymous shell companies and financial crime is obviously nothing new, but the flurry of new standards being implemented across jurisdictions is maybe a little bit new. I mean, uh, Rashmi, I was wondering if, as a starting point, if you could provide us with a, a background of some of the, the most recent interesting updates. Uh, sure. So it all starts at the top, right? Anything that happens in AML... Uh, the genesis is usually with some development uh, at the FADF level. So the FADF uh, recently revised Recommendation 24, which deals with beneficial ownership, specifically uh, uh, designed to address the risk of shell companies. And um, one of the key developments there is the focus on beneficial ownership registries. We've tried doing this as individual actors in each bank, each FI out there trying to uh, uh, get hold of beneficial ownership of uh, our customers and trying to um, corroborate it uh, independently. But there are many challenges uh, in, in taking that siloed approach. Uh, it's not a very, um, it, it's not effective, and uh, the fact of focus is on effectiveness. It's not very effective, let me say, uh, and it costs a lot of money, right? So um, the FADF is now focused on um, the establishment of beneficial ownership registry. So that's the next step, right? There are uh, initiatives underway in several jurisdictions already to establish beneficial ownership registries, either as a standalone entity or um, uh, through uh, agencies that could provide the same information. And that is now going to be, um, it, it, it was viewed as um, uh, you know, something that certain jurisdictions were doing over and above, but now that's that's uh, going to be the baseline. Every jurisdiction is expected to put in place some form of uh, beneficial ownership registry, and that's a that's a big development and a very positive one as far as um, financial institutions are concerned. Um, so, with the establishment of these uh, beneficial ownership registries, you you will have um, uh, you there will be um, uh, uh, amendments to local regulations to accommodate the use of these registries and to set out the framework for using these registries. But we, we've also seen a lot of regulatory guidances come out, especially um, uh, following the COVID pandemic, where there were a lot of, um, uh, there's a sudden increase in fraud. Uh, and more recently, uh, with the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the Russian sanctions that uh, followed, uh, there are, uh, again, regulatory guidances, many of them focused on the misuse of, um, uh, the, the, the misuse of legal persons uh, 
by way of shell companies. Uh, on the shell company front, Brad, I wouldn't say there is anything remarkably new coming out from the regulators, but it's uh, it's an in increased urgency in the recognition that uh, shell companies are a key gateway for money laundering. And um, you know, it's been decades uh, since uh, since uh, you know we had the first uh, major international case involving the use of shell companies and we've made very little headway. So there is increased guidance from uh, regulators. The uh, MAS especially has been relentless in um, pursuing this risk and attempting to nail it down. Um, the guidances provide very good uh, information on typologies, red flags, uh, in including in some instances, case studies that the regulators have uh, come across. So it's a, it's a good read and uh, there's a lot of useful information in there for banks, but. Uh, at a very fundamental level, if you ask me if there's something new and um, automatically different, I wouldn't uh, say there is. Next, you, you have had a lot of interesting keywords there. You mentioned a lot of money, ineffective, nothing new, uh, and sense of urgency, uh, which I think that hopefully we'll, we'll, some of these things we'll, we'll, we'll drop, delve into a little bit more. I mean, ideally for today's discussion, I'd really like to focus on the use of shell companies by organized bad actor networks versus individuals. I mean, Adam, with this in mind, from your perspective, how important are shell companies in executing modern financial crime? And I guess, more importantly, are they more or less relevant today than they were 10 years ago? And if so, what, character, what you know, characteristics continue to make them you know, attractive to the criminal element? Great, great question. Um, uh, have, have they changed in the last 10 years? And have the topology changed in the last 10 years? No, <laughs> quite simply. Um, you know, they, they've been around for, for decades, um, literally. Um, the, the use of corporates and shell companies has been around for decades. And actually, there's, there's an individual called, um, I don't know if you know him, but Robert Mazur. He's an ex um, US um, enforcement agent who infiltrated um, the cartels in Mexico and basically acted as their, um, their money launderer and he, he fed intelligence back to the US law enforcement. And he, do, he does the, um, the speaking circuit now, he does it a lot in, in Europe and the, the US. Um, and, you know, there's a few points he's made um, recently really was saying that actually he used to create corporates to launder money for the cartels. Um, and he used to send money in offshore jurisdictions and places like London and Singapore, so big financial centers that make, gave it legitimacy. And he was like, since I did it back in the 80s and the 70s, and now he said, nothing's really changed. And there's the old adage that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so the criminals aren't fixing it because they're still getting away with it. And there's a few things that um, Rashmi said, um, which I think is, you know, really important to know. And one of those things in the reg terms of regulation is the UK, um, I know we're sort of going out the side the APAC region, but I think this is really worthy of note is, you know, last month they brought out what they call the criminal um, economic crime bill, um, bill, sorry. And this is really in, in result and as a result of the Russian um, invasion, you know, with, with Ukraine. And basically, um, UK, and I think it's, it's no, not globally, right, the UK is almost a hub of money laundering. Um, there's lots of property that's um, got illicit wealth locked up in it. Um, and, you know, it's been known about for ages, but nothing's really been done about it. And the Economic Crime Act has really come in saying, actually, you know, if a property is owned by an offshore company, and this comes back to the whole, this whole shell issue, and this maybe these loopholes that criminals are utilising, um, now the bill says that if you if the property is owned by an offshore company, that company has to declare who the UBOs are. So ultimately, who owns this property? And it's quite stringent. So if you don't declare who the owner is, or you you lie about it, it, it there's a criminal prosecution. If you don't declare who the UBO is. You can't sell the property, you can't lease the property, and you can't transfer the property. So you're literally locked with this property that you can't do anything with um, if you don't declare it. So it's quite strong, powerful legislation. So it is moving in the right direction, but it's just taken us a long time to get here. And I, th I think another point, um, before I move on to some other points about why the criminal is still using it, um, is around this whole UBO um, registry. And Patef brought it out um, saying that it has to happen. And actually in Europe, um, through the fifth money laundering director, which which should have come into force in 2020. And I say should um, for, for this very reason, should have come into force in 2020. And one of those stipulations in the directive was that across Europe, each jurisdiction had to have an open publicly, publicly accessible 
UBO register. Okay, and so that means anyone can log into the register in each country, like Companies House in the UK, um, look at a company and see who the UBO is. Has it come into a force across Europe? No, it hasn't. Um, even though it came into 2020 in, into um, legislation, um, I did some research on it back in January, and it's um, four EU member states um, still have a private registry, so you can't access it um, publicly. Um, a number of them still chart have a paywall up against it, so you have to pay to access the registry. And three countries still have no registry at all. Um, and this is what we're now looking two years later. So FATF have said this is a guidance. EU said this is law. <laughs> but even with that, countries still haven't progressed enough to to um, implement these UBO registers. And, and one other thing, you know, going back to my question, sorry, um, I've digressed a little bit, I think, um, but I think they're just important points to add. You know, why are these such good um, use, why do criminals use corporate structures? It's the anonymity you can get from them. You can have a company that's owned by a company that's owned by a company across multiple jurisdictions. And as an organization, FI trying to work out who the UBO is, it can take you a long time, um, especially if there's not the data available internationally, um, especially if it's it's a very complex web of organisations. And you just have to look at um, there's a you know Scottish LPs is are infamous for being utilised by um, launderers. And why is that? Because limited partnerships normally you have to declare who the partners are, and the partners are generally the people who ultimately run and control the partnership. With Scottish LPs, that isn't the case, right? Scottish LPs, in its own right is a legal entity. It can sign contracts, it can own property without even declaring who the partners are. Um, so you, you get that veil of secrecy. When you when the partners suddenly become corporate entities and then the corporate entities are owned by corporate entities again, it, it becomes very messy, very complex and, and very secretive. Uh, so I've gone off on a bit of tangents here and but I just, you know, I think ultimately what am I saying here is corporates have still been utilised. They were utilised 10 years ago. And why is this? because they still work. They still give an air of secrecy. There's still no validation in court companies' registers. Um, I can call myself Mickey Mouse and you know have a company in probably a few hours. Um, so yeah, so, so it, I think there's things we need to do still to increase transparency, and, and that's why it's still utilized today um, by, by criminals. And um, yeah, if I may add to that, uh, it's cheap. It, it doesn't cost much to set up these companies. It's just, just a couple, uh, couple of hundred dollars or so, and you've got yourself a company. And uh, to your point on the organized um, in a network of companies, but professional, what we call professional money laundering networks versus individual actors, uh, it makes sense if you think about it, right? You, you, it's so cheap to set up these companies and it's so easy. You have a few dozen companies set up and ready to go. You never know when you're going to need to route money through which jurisdiction and you have bank accounts set up for them uh, in all the major financial centers with a few different banks. And um, you know, even if there are problems with uh, your accounts in one of the banks, you can always use some other bank, some other account to move money around. If you pick up one, you shut that down, uh, th there are a, a dozen backups that you can use, right? So it's like whack-a-mole. Uh, no bank has a systemic view, so we can't see mm -hmm all the different uh, parts of that network that have accounts everywhere. So we see what goes through us. And even if we pick that up as a shell company and uh, illicit activity, shut it down, uh, they can easily route payments through uh, somewhere else. And it, it, it happened with the, the Russian laundromat was now several years back, right? And the R Russian laundromat, there were thousands of shell companies that, uh, that had been set up all over the world. And uh, if you ask me, you know, whether governments all over the world are in a stronger position to confidently say that uh, there isn't a similar setup now that, that they have uh, established over the last few years. I, I don't think anybody can confidently answer that. that there pro there's probably a network out there. I mean, I'm just listening to your comments. I mean, you, you, you both sound kind of both, uh, you know, uh... Uh, optimistic and and kind of depressing uh, depressed at the same time saying that you know we are trying to do something but you know th th there's lots of barriers in the way i mean it is easy to talk about show companies but given their very nature it's very difficult to detect them especially when you look at the levels of sophistication in hiding or commingling i guess uh, legitimate you know financial purposes with illicit financial flows i mean 
Chin Hong, from your perspective, what is the role of technology once un 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 untangle these types of relationships? Uh, and from a data perspective, you know, what types of success have you seen? Uh, and what, what are the areas that you, you, from your perspective, still need improvement? Uh, when you look at this, it's a whole you know ecosystem and it's a whole life cycle of it, right? So start of the 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 life cycle will be first of all uh, the origination, which is the setup of these companies and the startup account opening. I think uh, the level of sophistication, of course, uh, is because the shell companies, the nominee directors, uh, they are trying to masquerade their true intent. They are trying to masquerade themselves as an operation uh, that is not there, right? So they are using different trade financing or trade transactions to mask some of these transaction to transfer you know the money all over the place right so you know, the first step of this is the you know, can the the banks actually tell uh you know who are these shell companies and i uh, do you have the ability uh, to actually detect this now you know as every uh, experienced analyst will tell you right if you have a profile you put it in front of them they will be able to tell whether there's a shell company or because there are some typologies that are you know very obvious right so you know but the thing is once you're doing it at scale can you then you know unravel and decipher it and technology and using data uh it, you know gives you that perspective An example right you know we've seen a lot of companies are uh, being uh, incorporated using in housed under a single address, right? So the the idea is, can you get the context of it? Whether is this does this make sense, right? So if you have a fintech that startup, yes, you know, maybe it makes sense. But no, you're gonna have a lot of uh, corporate uh, services or trade, you know, or, you know different type of typology of companies. Uh, you know, they're all you know incorporated in a similar address or the same address that we've seen before. Uh, you know, does it make any kind of commercial sense, right? So using technology to give a context to the profile of the client or rather the, the, the profile of the corporate, uh, it will give you some view, a level of view during the onboarding stage to look at you know, what kind of risk you are looking at. And of course, you know, having external intelligence and data, you try to unravel and uncover some of these bad actors. Uh, granted, you know, of course, we know not all you know, uh, jurisdictions have a full registry of information, uh, but you're ha having some of this external data, you build to start to unwrap and un look at you know some of these directors and, and some of the risk data point. Example: Do they have you know hundreds and hundreds of multiple concurrent ownership or uh, multiple uh, directorship? Do they have a history of uh, historical profile uh, of being directors of hundreds of companies as well? And what are the status of this company? Right? Can you see it? Right. So having external intelligence and having the technology to give you the, the, the information at a glance will help the analyst to be able to look at all this uh, typology uh, during the onboarding stage uh, and, and recognize some of these high risk factors uh, fairly quickly right, to give it a context. Then, of course, uh, the next part of it is to look at the entire transaction, right? So then uh, it's a part of looking whether uh, this account, have they been around dormant for a long time and you know, suddenly you're going to see a spike of activities. So we are talking about behavioral profiling, right? And once that kind of behavioral profile triggers the sort of investigation to build complete the entire network, you will want to see if the counterparty is, you know, again, another shell. Now, the difficulty for banks, as you say, is because, you know, you may know your clients well, but you may not know the counterparty, right? So it's, it's now you know, progressively where we're beginning to see, right, uh, that you cannot depend on your counterparty bank to do their due diligence and say that, hey, look, you know, I, I, I'm all right, right? You know, but we've seen enforcement actions taken for settlements in certain jurisdictions uh, where they did not unravel the source of funds, right? And this came from Russia and uh, we see, you know, banks are uh, getting in trouble for those settlements. So, you know, you have to understand then the nature of the counterparty. Again, you have to use technology and external intelligence to be able to unwrap those counterparty as you would your mm -hmm. own client, especially if there are behavioral profile that triggers those sort of investigation, right? So, and of course, uh, you know, working with the likes of uh, Adam, right? You know, there are technology players out there, uh, there are information providers out there uh, that will be able to, you know, put this uh, sort of uh, solutions together to untangles this sort of a very complex relationship and a complex structure. And sorry, Brad, can I, can I just, can I just jump in? So you know, some really good points there, and I just, I'd like to sort of tangentialize it with um, some some examples, really, with with sort of how this actually works in practice, and where you know, if technology had been implemented and this data had been brought together it probably would have been spotted a lot sooner. So um, you've, everyone's probably heard of the FinCEN leaks, right? I think it's back in 2020, the FinCEN files got leaked um, and, you know, some investigative journalists done some research and, and checked and, and sort of tried to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And there was one particular example that, you know, if we utilize um, what's just been mentioned, 
with with a technology perspective where you could do the networks you could you know do things like identity resolution you could do things like you know um you know machine learning all that analysis piece you know this would have you know banks would have gone this doesn't look quite right here maybe we shouldn't be on board in these customers and the example here is you know i'm going back to the uk but you know this is this is a really powerful example that you know there's an infamous address and actually when i was in the police i was in law enforcement um back in the day um it was still infamous then it's it's a something called Darks Lane so it's a, it's a place just outside London um, Potter, I think it's Potter's Bar I think it is um, and it's literally a second floor building it's a little office literally a tiny office and it was a company incorporation um, agent and I think they're doing incorporated in total about seven eight thousand companies um, it turns out that a thousand of those were actually suspected of money laundering um, <laughs> through the through the UK and there was two companies in particular that stand out there was one called Ergo Invest um, very original and there's one called chadberg trade and <laughs> these two companies were incorporated at its potter's bar address um in darks lane and they both reported on their sort of company's house um registers you have to put your filings into a company's house and it's very basic right and you can you don't have to tell the truth because company's house don't val validate it but then that's not not their job um but they both identically put put through twenty one thousand three hundred and fifty three pounds sterling as part of their annual um, income and turnover and the investigative journalist pulled, pulled together some documents and you know some of these were publicly available some of them weren't but they they pulled together data um through an investigation and found that one of the companies put through 535 million through their account and the other company put through 1.99 billion through their account uh, which is slightly different to twenty one thousand. Um, and I guess my example, my my point here is, had there been a technology that can say actually uh, onboarding, this is addressing Potter's Bar in Dark's Lane. There's a, seven thousand more companies registered here. Some of these are actually looking suspicious, and actually the filings that we've had from, you know, companies house is saying that they're turning over twenty one thousand. But actually, we have the customers on the on the accounts. They've just put three five hundred thirty five million through our accounts, right? And you, you go, well, that doesn't quite look right, does it? Um, you might do an investigation, maybe. Um, but it's, it's that technology piece could probably help put the pieces of the puzzle together um, to help you spot it quicker. Yeah, Adam, if, if I may just add an Asia pack uh, flavor to it, right? Brilliant, if you yeah. remember the Wirecard, Wirecard incident, right? The partners that they had in Philippines, it was incorporated in the residential address and uh, one of them, you know, was in a, in a hut or some sort of a house, right? So, you know, if, if investigation was done or some validation was done, you'll be able to tell fairly quickly this is not a plausible address uh, for such a uh, operation. I mean, that is one of the challenges though with Asia though. There are a lot of different approaches. I mean, I remember when I first moved to China, there, it was quite common for companies to be registered at residential addresses and things like that. But this then, I guess you brought up two really important issues. It's about scalability and, and validation. I mean, Rashmi, from your perspective, when we look at the FATF concerns about the who and the how of establishing the identity of a shell company's owners, I mean, are you using technology to help you with this process? And if so, how? So, um, uh, okay, I want to give a shout out to Wolfsburg here because this is not a challenge that, uh, that uh, you know, MUFG is facing in its own, but uh, it's a challenge for the industry. And uh, uh, whenever there's a challenge for the, that, that, that's industry wide, uh, it's picked up by groups such as Wolfsburg to try and find a solution, try and identify best practices. So. Uh, this is actually an area of focus for the Wolfsburg right now and something that we are working on uh, as a group to, uh, to, to try and uh, identify best practices. The, the solution is going to be, uh, you know, while uh, it's important to recognize that there are certain best practices that are uh, equally applicable to uh, everybody in the industry, the solution is going to be different for different banks. There are um, large banks in the market. If you look at Singapore, there are um, uh, banks that uh, only deal in wholesale clients, you know, large multinational corporates or FIs, where, uh, whereas there are uh, banks that have a huge commercial bank business. Um, mm -hmm. And this type of uh, shell company risk presents and I'm not saying that risk doesn't present to wholesale banks, right? The, the risk presents in different ways uh, to uh, different banks. So when you have a portfolio of SME companies, it's uh, it becomes more important that you have uh, technology tools that uh, help you do entity resolution and uh, the sort of um, analysis that both uh, 
Shun Hong and Adam talked about uh, at the time of onboarding, where uh, at the system level, you have uh, the tools to flag out uh, anomalies, uh, which is very different when you're a wholesale bank, you know, at the uh, dealing with uh, large multinational corporations, well-established businesses at the high end. And the risk in that instance presents differently. The risk comes from uh, counterparties that your customer deals with, you know, who are your customers, uh, suppliers, who are their customers, who are they transacting with, and uh, how they could then inadvertently expose you to a professional money laundering uh, network. So, for example, you have a large corporate customer that has a very legitimate uh, manufacturing business. They are selling goods um, to um, businesses all over the world. Some of these businesses that are downstream to them may not be uh, legitimate. You know, they, uh, they purchase goods, but then you may see payments coming from unrelated um, third parties, uh, some of whom could be shell companies, right? So the risk present in different ways. Uh, the risk could present from uh, your uh, credit side where uh, you're extending uh, loans and um, uh, the your, comp your customer whose uh, large reputed company is um, uh, applying for a loan for a, a, a uh, you know, for procurement or a uh, particular project. And then uh, you need to look at the beneficiaries of the funds there and who the funds are getting disbursed to. So even if your direct customer doesn't present these risks, uh, the risk still touches your institution indirectly through their counterparties. Now, uh, coming back to the fat of recommendations, again, um, uh, FATF recommendations are uh, layered, right? So there are recommendations that apply at the jurisdictional level. They are targeted at uh, governments and uh, uh, supervisors in different jurisdictions. And then there are recommendations that apply to uh, financial institutions or other uh, 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 non-bank uh, 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 financial institutions. Um, now, the focus is... Uh, most definitely on uh, understanding beneficial ownership. That's that's at the root, right? So you can look at transactional typologies, you can look at behavioral typologies, but uh, the first step is understanding beneficial ownership. And that is where uh, a lot of the focus of the fire of guidance is on. And uh, uh, I, I think on that front, uh, we will see developments as the beneficial ownership registries get established. So it could be by way of beneficial ownership registries. It could be by way of um, KYC utilities. You know, that's that's uh, another um, area to watch. You know, where, which jurisdictions are successful in setting out uh, a KYC utility, which will then take care of this beneficial ownership resolution problem. Um, and lastly, uh, initiators in Singapore are uh, cosmic, where we're able to share intelligence across banks. That's also very helpful because um, uh, it, it, these risks are not uh, bank specific. You know, when, when there is a network wanting to route uh, illicit flows, they may do it through a couple of major uh, financial centers. And typically, uh, you, you will see the involvement of countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, UK, as uh, Adam yep. said, UK seems to be at the center of uh, a lot of these uh, flows. So they go through the larger centers. You don't see these flows going through the likes of Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, highly, highly uh, unlikely. Um, so again, uh, any infrastructure that allows us the ability to share information across uh, banks that that would be uh th that's going to be very helpful too so i'd like to come to that back to those high risk jurisdictions in just a moment but you did raise something really interesting around cosmic i mean yes it, it is planned but cosmic as i understand only has six institutions and those are the largest institutions one it's still in the technology build out it's not live yet but i guess isn't there going to be a risk that especially given their focus on shell companies and trade-based money laundering that that's just going to push bad actors from the big institutions down to the medium-sized institutions down to the smaller institutions you're not necessarily going to remove them from the system uh it's uh it's a first step right? it's important to recognize that it is a first step and it's a really really good first step um the 
there are different considerations that need to be balanced. You know, while allowing for greater transparency and the ability to share risk information seamlessly, we cannot completely ignore any considerations for privacy. Okay. So those two uh, considerations have to be balanced. And uh, uh, I'm, I mean, speaking as an outsider, my um, assessment is that they are piloting with a large FIs because that's where a lot of the risk is concentrated, and they have the uh, they also have the skill set and the competency. You know, they can bring the best of their talent to the table to build a framework that's really robust. And once the framework is, um, it, 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 once a framework is designed and all the kinks are ironed out, I would fully expect that it would be rolled out across the industry. I, I, I personally, I don't think this is going to be limited to just the six banks in, in the long run. It makes sense. It will expand over time. But it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the privacy part. I mean, you know, Shumon, I mean, when we look at it, bad data in will obviously mean bad data out. Um, you know, Adam already mentioned, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So that's kind of the attitude of the bad actors. So from your perspective, is there a data problem? If so, where are you seeing firms using alternative data sources? Uh, and, or otherwise, how are they remedying these data type issues? Yeah, I think right now what we see is that there's no lack of data information. There's an uh, over-influx of data and how do you make sense of it. Uh, and when we talk about bad data, I don't think they're bad per se. Uh, the thing is how do we make sense of them, right? So, you know, we talk about having registries uh, you know, in, in, in the EU and of course registries uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, that's a good step. But uh, I think the more important step is to make sense of the data that's coming into the registry, right? It doesn't take much less, uh, you know, like Rashmi and Adam say, it doesn't take much, it doesn't cost much to register a company and put an ID inside there to say, hey, look, you know, I'm the UBO of this particular company. Now, the thing is, does it have any contextual sense, right? So that's why uh, having all this data into the banks, yes, you have a UBO, but is that a true UBO? How is that a nominee? Right? Do you have the context to understand you know, if, if this uh, information uh, makes sense? Right? So, uh, well, in, instead of saying, uh, well, I will put it in a different manner of you know, instead of saying, uh, using alternative data, I'll say you know, having the ability to network link and give it a, a, a context uh, sometimes will help, right? like I mentioned. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of the shell companies are now incorporated you know, everywhere in the world now. They're not just restricted to the high-risk jurisdiction or financial hub. We've seen that everywhere now. Now, the thing is that do you have the ability to resolute these people? And sometimes the individuals, uh, they are you know, acting as a, a, a well, well, we call it a nominee, but they're like a the company secretariat, right? So they are the signatory for hundreds and hundreds of companies. Are you able to link this up and have a view of them? And if there is a particular company that was already enforced, right, you know, in your adverse media or in the enforcement list, and if you can find this company and you're find, finding the link into this particular nominee, you then progressively will be able to have a view of the rest of the hundred companies that he's linked to. And if you're onboarding one of them, then you will then flag it and have have a, a probably a, a enhanced view, right, when they're doing their transactions. Uh, so, you know, I'll say that you know inst institution uh, should make better use of external intelligence and you know, this you know, very soft technologies to have a view of the information outside of the bank and the jurisdiction, right? Not just within the bank. Uh, many a times, if you are just network link anything within the bank, uh, you realize when you're trying to find the linkages of some transactions or bad actors, it goes to another bank, a nostril account, because you don't have any other information on the counterparty other than the correspondent bank that you're dealing with, right? So that's not going to help uh, in a great, greater scale of things to understand, you know, look, is there a shell company in my mix and who is he dealing with? Or am I exposing my clients or my institution uh, to another transaction that's done by a shell company from another jurisdiction? And I think uh, it's a fair view to say not every jurisdiction uh, have the same level and uh, I'll say due diligence uh, when it comes to onboarding some of these companies, right? So uh, you you, know, you cannot, as I said, you cannot just depend on your counterparty uh, to do the CDD, uh, especially when we're saying uh, now like incorporating shell companies are just so simple and so easy. Uh, you never know who's gonna you know. You know use your, your bank and, and, and the funds you know, that's being transferred into your uh, financial institution. I mean, Adam, we've mentioned, we've talked about this many times in the past about the, the network threat assessments uh, and contextualization of data and things like that. I mean, where are you seeing kind of the biggest success in firms trying to contextualize the data across disparate kind of data sets? 
I hear mute. <laughs> it, that, that would help, wouldn't it, if I wasn't on mute. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I think really, look, what, what I'm what I'm seeing is, you know, I, I think it starts. I think it starts at home, right, in terms of um, contextualizing the data. And especially in some of the large organizations, you know, even having come from a large organization myself, you know, you have so many disparate systems, you've got dis disparate teams and disparate data sets, ultimately. So, you know, if you've got a big organization, you might have a wholesale um, part of the business, you know, an investment part of the business, maybe a retail part of the business, you know, an asset wealth management part of the business. Um, so you've got, any, you know, maybe even a trade finance part of the business, you know, who knows, but you potentially got all these different teams, different systems, doesn't talk to each other. You've then got compliance teams. You might have a sanctions team that sits one place. You've got a TM team that sits somewhere else, a KY team that sits somewhere else. So you get the picture, you know, this just builds and builds and builds. And you know, might have people doing duplicate work. You might have duplicate alerts coming out for the same thing, but everyone's working it differently. And so I think this whole network piece is just first and foremost, start with the organization itself. You know, bring the data sets together, bring the different systems together and just have have everything talking to each other um you know deduplication of data you know i think a lot of firms probably have you know i'm, I'm plucking a number out hit the hit the air here but i don't think it's far from the truth is probably 20 percent of um records are possibly duplicates of in some way shape or form so you know get rid of the duplicates first and you can then start building networks so you, once you've got rid of the duplicates you've got the data sets cut together you can start looking at you know who is this person do they have a retail account do they have a investment account you know etc cetera, etc cetera. But then it's also, you know, the points made earlier is, is this whole network data externally. So there's there's a rich data set available outside, you know, e free data, um, you know, through some of the search engines, you can probably search for data just through that alone. And then obviously you've got premium sources where you can pay, um, you know, you can pay for data sets, you know, things like Moody's, for example, is, you know, on the call. So th there's things you can do where you can actually gather data together. Um, but yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, it starts at home, get your data right at home first and foremost, build the networks at home, deduplicate your data at home, create that single profile, and then, you know, you can move on to the external data and then start enriching that data. Um, and like, like I said, you know, there, there's technology available to do that, you know, but there is still a human element to it, right? I'm not saying that technology is going to replace humans. It, it can't, I, I don't think another 20 years, 30 years, but it's an it's a help, it's a tool to help you look at the right data um, in, in a more contextual way. I mean, that's been a common theme, I think, of the last two days, that technology is not the silver bullet. It is the balance between, you know, automation with the, the expertise. Uh, and if anything, the human element, we're, we're moving from generalists to specialists uh, in terms of our focus. You know, we're going to be a, 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 a proliferation finance specialist. We're going to be a trade-based money laundering specialist, able to really deep dive. Uh, do you agree, Adam? Yeah, I, I, think, I think so. I, I do see teams coming together a little bit more um, because, you know, yeah, you know, again, I've looked worked for different places where you've got different AML teams depending on what part of the business you're looking at, um, and you've got different fraud team. But actually, fraud and AML is, is getting a little bit closer. You know, you hear this sort of, these things where fraud teams and AML teams are now starting to work close together. You know, capital markets as well. There's a big thing about money launching capital markets going through at the moment. Um, you know, that's been kicking off for the last couple of years and, and being kicked about um, for a while. You know, bring cap markets teams, AML teams together. Um, yeah, so yes, you do still need specialisms, but I also think you need to have somebody you can sort of look across the house, um, so to speak, as well. That's right. I think you just politely disagreed with me, but that's perfectly fine. Um, I did want to come back to a couple of points there. So, Adam, I asked you at the start originally, you know, 10 years on, are we, are we even better at this? And, and likewise, Rashmi has also highlighted, you know, she believes that the high-risk jurisdictions would have been easily caught. I'm not sure if the panel has read the book Global Shell Games from 2014. Uh, by Michael Finlay, it, it was around some experiments in trans transnational relationships and, and crime and terrorism. But they recently did an experiment in, in 2021, October, where they created 12 different entities in high risk jurisdictions. You know, these were in uh, corrupt jurisdictions known for corruption, for, uh, for nuclear financing and terrorism. Uh, as well as tax avoidance, and they approached five thousand banks and seven thousand intermediaries. Uh, it'd be great to get the bank, your, you know, the panel's perspective on this. Do you think that these high-risk jurisdiction entities were caught by banking systems or not? So, uh, I think, this, this is yeah. uh, this is a comment that I wanted to make earlier when you were talking about high-risk jurisdictions. Uh, from the discussion, right? Uh, we've. I think we've, uh, it, it's very clear that a lot of the flows actually go through the major financial centers. And um, when you talk about high-risk jurisdictions, these are the actual 
how does Jesus yes. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. um, And this is the interesting point, right? So of those, let's say, more than 11,000, 12,000 different uh, kind of institutions they approached, they found that basically for these 12 different companies, there was almost no difference in the bank's, you know, deposition to open up a bank account or, or run, uh, you know, operational accounts for any of these 12 entities. There were a couple of areas where, that were caught, right? But overall, you know, whether the, the, the entities were set up in the Seychelles, the BBI for tax avoidance and things like that. I mean, I guess the big question, you know, is, you know, Rashmi, from your perspective, is the risk-based approach broken? Is there a better way that we should be implementing this? I absolutely think the risk-based approach is working, at least at the large global banks uh, and, and in the major financial markets of the banks that are regulated uh, under strong regulators. The risk-based approach is working, but... Um, there are other considerations at uh, play, right? So, uh, uh, in, in the context of data sharing, privacy is the other consideration that needs to be balanced with uh, the fin crimes risk mitigation. Uh, when it comes to account opening, the consideration uh, you know that's at the other end of the spectrum is uh, financial inclusion. You cannot just uh, stop open opening accounts for uh, small and medium companies and developing countries uh, just because you think they are high risk and uh, prone to money laundering risk. So there's, there are other considerations that you need to weigh them against. And um, the SME businesses are usually, they operate at scale, um, okay. right? So you will have a single RM probably covering a few hundred customers. So you don't have that one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. So their account opening may not be the biggest hurdle unless uh, there's a very clear red flag because you don't want to exclude uh, SME businesses. Uh, these are the lifebloods of some of these economies. Uh, but what you know, getting better quality intelligence that would help these banks inform those decisions. That that's why technology is key because for these businesses that operate at scale. It's not possible for a human being to sit there and do case by case uh, detailed due diligence. It, it, the, the ability to have um, analytics that looks at both internal data and external data is it's it's really key. And you will so, probably find sorry. that that experiment will have a uh, different result uh, once we have better technology embedded. Well, I, I was going to ask. If I, sorry, sorry, go. Sorry. If I may add, uh, I think everyone should be presumed to be innocent, right, until proven guilty. So we shouldn't exclude anyone from the financial system. But I think well, what for the SME, if uh, something that could be done better is you're able to profile what would be a profile of a good SME, right? So because they're at scale, if you can build a normalized profile, uh, then when a bad actor comes along and it, it shows some anomaly uh, during the onboarding stage, uh, you might be able to flag it a little bit better. Right, so that might be one of the areas where I think uh, maybe uh, you can do better. The, the you know, financial institutions across the, all the world can do a little bit better, uh, especially dealing with some of this uh, small medium enterprise. Adam, I mean, of these 12,000 institutions that included everything from the largest to the smallest types of firms, I mean, they must have technology in place. Where do you think that they're going wrong? So I, I think, look, you can only work with what you've got, can't you, um, in terms of data. And if a customer comes to you and says, here's my company incorporation record, this is my expected business, um, that all checks out. Um, but you don't have the technology, you know, people have technology, but I think things like network link analysis, you know, some, some of the identity resolution stuff, it's been around for a while, but I think it's only just starting to get used by a lot of the, the financial institutions, or well, at least from what I'm seeing anyway. So I think, yes, there's technology there, but I just don't think the technology in the past was at the scale where you could start building out these networks, understanding who's connected to who. And so the banks, you know, the FIs globally are working on what they can see and what they're being told ultimately. Um, and there's, there's very limited validation happening. And I think that's what's probably gone wrong is, you know, that they, they take it at face value, um, you know, innocent until proven guilty, as, as was said, um, and they on board. And if you don't have the data available to say it's bad, then you're not going to off board and you know just because it's a high risk ju jurisdiction or just as, because it's in a tax haven doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong you know that these come these countries exist for a reason people in incorporate companies there for a reason you know it doesn't make it illegal um but yeah i, I think the technology is just starting to come into its own uh now and i, I think that's probably why that technology but maybe not at the scale where you can you can join the dots 
So you do expect in the next decade, if we have this conversation in 10 years, that you'll be far more optimistic that we're actually able to weed this out? Is that, that, that what you're saying? Uh, absolutely. You know, I'm definitely seeing more conversations happening. I'm definitely seeing more um, financial institutions coming, you know, coming to us and saying, you know, we need to do this. We want to do this. And, you know, network analytics, um, you know, entity resolution, all this stuff is now forefront now of, of conversations happening um, globally. Um, and it wasn't. And to be fair, 80, even 18 months ago, this what they, these weren't the conversations being had in, in the industry. So, you know, give it another five years. I think this will just be a core requirement that, that um, FIs are wanting. Makes perfect sense. We, we unfortunately have two minutes left, so I just kind of wanted to get the panel's thoughts on I, I know the horizon. You know, what's top of mind issues for the next twelve to eighteen months? I mean, more importantly, is there anything on the horizon that has you concerned, uh, Rashmi? A second Russian laundromat. It's going to come. Second out. Russian laundromat. <laughs> yeah, I love the consensus. You know. You're, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Now, as the pandemic ends, we're going to see a lot of government funds to you know, revive the economy. Uh, one more it is uh, some of these funds might be uh, going to the wrong places, abused by you know, criminal organizations. And Adam? So I, I'm going to be I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic in terms of where we're going. I think consortium is going to be we're going to see a big um, shift in consortium approaches. You know, cosmic. There, there's a couple of initiatives in Europe happening. I think these will get more mainstream. Um, so I think that's where we need to go. And the, the other one in terms of um, I think the positivity is I think governments are now starting to wake up to the fact that transparency is an issue. It does cause economic detriment um, to countries. You know, and just like the UK have done, I think we're going to see X regulations, transparency requirements um, happening globally. So just on a positive note, on the back of that research, I mean, they did discover those three different areas that they were exploring, tax avoidance, financial crime, and terrorism financing. Uh, the, the, big, the financial companies were actually weeding out the terrorism financing connected companies through their experiments. So that is a little bit good. I mean, they did find, unfortunately, uh, that corporate service providers were even worse than financial institutions in terms of not being able to identify the, the, the bad actors that they were that I, uh, that trying to onboard through their experiment. But unfortunately, with that, we're out of time. Thank you to our panel of experts, Adam McLaughlin, Director, Global Head of Financial Crime with NICE Actimize, Shun Hong Tra, Senior Director, Head of Financial Crime Practice, Asia Pacific to the Middle East with Moody's Analytics, and Rashmi Dubier, Managing Director, Asia Pacific Head of AML MUFG. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, expertise and insights this afternoon. Up next is our next panel set of emergency data and technology lessons from sanctions and trade bans with our very own Manesh Damtani, Editor, Regulation Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.